And good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us here on Two Guys in a Bible. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. And with me is Daniel Rogers from Alabama. Uh, I started to say Florida, but he just moved back to Alabama. And um, I ho hope you missed all of that hurricane stuff there, Daniel. You know, what's interesting is when we moved to Alabama, uh, or rather when we moved to Florida, there was not a single hurricane that came through our part of the state. Huh. And, and we got out uh, just in time, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, all of the pictures that I've seen of, Lu of Louisiana, even Mississippi, it was really a horrendous uh, situation. And so glad, glad, glad that you didn't have to go through any of that. Uh, it's just so difficult to imagine the destructive power of a hurricane and, and flooding. Now I, I can testify p firsthand of the power of flooding because I have, I've personally been involved in two flooding situations. Uh, one of them nearly swept me off of the highway. Uh, I, I, you know, I just have to count the good Lord and thank him for the fact that I did not gets completely swept away. Uh, the, uh, the water actually moved my pickup sideways almost a foot. Uh, and, you know, I was in the truck with my nephew and, you know, it, it's just, boy, you talk about scary. The power of water is, is literally unbelievable. And so um, anyway, uh, I've been involved in two different floods, witnessed another flood that was just of incredible proportions. Uh, as a young man. And so uh, when you see the devastation that, that has been brought about by the flooding and the wind and the, and the storm down there, you just have to sit back in amazement uh, at the power of God's creation. And uh, it can be both good and bad, obviously. Uh, good can come out of the bad, but uh, very, very glad that you didn't have to go through all of that. Well, we, we were pretty glad too, because that was the one thing that we were kind of worried about. Um, you know, I guess the we were kind of, you know, comparing Alabama to Florida. And the thing that we kept coming back to was in Alabama, you know, as I'm sure you have in Oklahoma, we have terrible tornadoes, especially here in North Alabama. And, you know, there's one that just comes and rips up the north part of the state uh, every few years or so. And it's always just so uh, devastating. And the thing about tornadoes is, is it's a complete surprise. You know, you never know when one could develop and come and you know, you just have a few hours, maybe that of, of warning, um, that that kind of storm is coming your way. And when you live in Florida though, at least they're able to tell you several weeks in advance, Hey, there's yeah. <laughs> that, well, that's true. And every part of the country has their own distinctive problems weather wise. But, um, here, here in Ardmore, Oklahoma, we live in what they call the tornado alley, uh, right. fr from here to Oklahoma city. And boy, I can tell you what, uh, we've had tornadoes come within a half a mile, even a quarter of a mile of our house and do major damage. We had one tornado come over our house and it, I, I used to have a 19 by 31 lean to shed out in my field from my house. And one year I was actually in Abilene uh, at Manning a booth with William at the time. And I called called in, you know, uh, later that afternoon, evening after we were done at the, with our booth uh, to check on my wife and everything. And she said, well, I'm just glad to be alive. And I said, what in the world happened? And she said, well, we heard a roar. I grabbed Lance, our son. He was just a little bitty fella at the time. And she said, I went to the bathtub and I grabbed a great big, huge pillow, uh, throw pillow, you know, oversized thing, more like a dog bed. And she said, I pulled it down over us. And she said, I came out and our shed was gone. And I had a eight by eight uh, shed on the Northwest corner of my rear patio. Uh, it evidently went to Canada or to Alaska. I don't know where it went. Uh, all I know is I had it completely 100% chock full of old Mustang parts. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. And I literally did not find one single one of those parts. I did not find even a shred of that little uh, eight by eight building. I mean, it literally disappeared. 
And I even would talk to people who lived north of me, north and east of me, because that's normally the way they travel. And I never heard of anybody who found anything. So I have uh, literally have no earthly idea where all of my Mustang parts went. And my shed out there in the field, the 19 by 31, same thing. I had all sorts of Mustang parts stacked up in it. Some of them very heavy stuff. And I mean, they were gone. Just absolutely, completely, totally gone. Well, and well, well, God must be a Dodge or a Chevy fan. I he guess. must be. I, I wondered about that <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> yeah, trying to send me a message or something. I don't know. But uh, then in 2005, uh, I'll never forget this. When I got up that morning, and it was, of course, before four o'clock when I left the house. But when I walked outside, I thought to myself, uh-oh, this doesn't feel good at all. You, you, could just, you could just feel in the air that this was something different that day. I mean, I've walked outside when it was raining cats and dogs. I've walked outside when there was tremendous wind. I have never, ever walked outside and just automatically looked around thinking, okay, this is not good. This is right. not going to be a good day. And during that day, I kept an eye on the sky and all the way back, as far as the eye could see, back to the south and the west, mostly from the west, you could see this ominous, ominous cloud buildup and you kept hearing on the news and watching the news folks this is going to be a massive massive storm of almost unprecedented strength so ladies and gentlemen you need to be watching this do not take this lightly or you can die and as it turns out, it was a tornado that was one mile wide, Daniel. There hasn't been anything like it since, <clears throat> at least in this part of the country. My wife and I sat just absolutely enraptured, engrossed, transfixed as we watched the weather that, that evening. And it was obvious it was going to go north of us. So we were not in the direct path, but we, we watched the weather as those storm chasers tracked it, chased it, and just one barn after another just literally exploded. And they even showed some cattle being caught up in it. And you know, of course, they were sufficiently far away from it, but they would point out little dots and they would say, ladies and gentlemen, what you're seeing right here is a car. What you're seeing right here is a cow or a horse. And they, I mean, they were just, they were just gone. And that storm uh, cut a one mile wide swath through Norman and Moore, Oklahoma. And the devastation in that was, was just almost unbelievable. You know, my wife and I drove up through that way about two weeks after it had done its deed. And you, you just looked in utter amazement at how buildings that had stood there for many, many, many years were no longer even there. The foundations were bare. It's just like you brought a demolition crew in and leveled it out, sweeped it off, and that was it. And story after story after story emerged of some of the weird things that happened during that storm. I'll, ne I'll never forget two stories that stuck in my mind. They showed on TV <clears throat> what was left of a house, and it was almost like a column. It was a two-story house. And obviously from the foundation up, and on the second floor, they showed a coffee table with a cup of water on it. The water was still in the cup. That coffee table with that water had been standing beside the bed 
<clears throat> of the owners of the house. It had completely, totally annihilated the rest of the house and left that one column with that coffee table and with that cup of water standing on it, hadn't touched it. Not a scratch and not a drop of water missing out of the cup. And it's just like, holy cow. And the other thing, and then we'll move on. But the other thing is there was one family that recorded and they were interviewing the wife and the family. They had a uh, cellar inside their house and the rest of the family went down in, into the cellar and they kept trying to get the husband to come on down. Come on, come on, come on. And he said, wait, I'll, I'll be, I'll be right there. I just want to watch. I just want to see it. And he waited too long and it took him and the entirety of the house away. And by the way, they, didn't, they never even found his body. He was just simply gone. And it was not a rapture. He was just simply gone. And it was really tragic. A car had, the storm had picked up a, a car from the street, took it right straight through. And and evidently that's when he was, he, he was evidently hit by that car. And the car was left, left in the house, what was left of the house. And he was gone, never to be seen again. So they're, they're just story after story after story, uh, you know, like that. And I can tell you this, <clears throat> after that storm and a year later, they had another not quite as strong, but it still did massive, massive amounts of, da- of damage and many, many people were killed. Uh, after that, my wife said, okay, we're getting a safe room. And <laughs> so we built us a safe room. It has walls that are 10 10 inches thick. It was designed to withstand wind of 200 miles an hour. And thankfully we haven't had to use it, but once or twice, but at least it's there. So uh, that's kind of my tornado story for the day. (laughs) They are, they are amazing manifestations of the nature that God has created. That's right. And I could add to that uh, my own collection of tornado stories, but uh, then this will turn into a weather podcast, and yeah. not a <laughs> John chapter four podcast. <laughs> uh, I just remember we uh, had a chicken house about a mile away from us that just got obliterated and we all had to go and help just pick up chicken after chicken after chicken. Oh, uh, wow. it, it was, it was awful. Yeah. Well, it's uh they are very, very amazing natural events. And, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of gotten to the point. I, I still love to watch them afar off. One more story here in Ardmore while we, um, uh, we were in an older building. Uh, the building was built in something like 1920, something, whatever it was. And we had given sufficient warning, but we were in Sunday services, Sunday evening services, and they sounded the alarm. And so a part of this building was underground. It was a, had a huge, huge basement uh, in it that we always used for our, what we called our Eaton meetings and what have you. And uh, so the whole congregation was down there, except a few of us, there were four or five of, of the men. We gathered on top of the steps uh, from the basement up to the ground level. And we watched in the West, we watched the funnel descend and hit the ground and we're standing there. We're thinking it's several, several miles away. And all of a sudden debris starts raining down on us. And so needless to say, the four or five of us, we did a mad dive (laughs) and uh, we went down in, we locked the door. We, we dead bolted it, all that kind of stuff like that. And when it had, when it had hit, it killed five people. Wow. And so it, it was an extremely dangerous storm. So like you said, well, you know, we could both continue, I'm sure, with stories like that. But this is not a, a po- weather podcast as such, <laughs> just kind of sharing some anecdotes with people. You know, folks, we, uh, we began a couple, of, a couple of programs ago, actually. And we are on the Messianic Temple. And John chapter 4 and Jesus' encounter with 
the woman at the well, as it is, uh, as it is commonly called, uh, this is a Samaritan woman and Jesus is in the Samaritan region. Now uh, we'll get into some more of that, of, of the details here in a moment, but it, it's, it is, been interesting to me down through the years of how people do not really correlate John chapter four with the messianic temple. But to me, it is uh, that it's just saturated with messianic temple motifs and themes and, and subjects. And it's a really good example to me, Daniel, of how in the fellowship in which both you and I were raised, we were not raised, at least I certainly wasn't, we were certainly not raised to appreciate, to recognize, and to utilize the Old Testament echoes, citations, allusions to the Old Testament prophets. Only occasionally was that done. Uh, the, the most that I can remember is when preachers would find references to the last days. And I go to Acts chapter two, where Peter said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And the preachers would say, well, see, Peter's saying the last days were beginning that very day, which of course he wasn't. But nonetheless, that's the argument that was made. And they would say, that's a direct quotation from Joel chapter two. And that's about as far as they would take that allusion or that reference, or they would run over to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. And I do remember some ministers uh, speaking about how this is a prediction of the establishment of the church, which is the house of the living God that run over to, to Timothy, where Paul would say to Timothy, I've written these things to you that you might know how you ought to behave yourself in the church. Uh, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And they say, ah, see, Isaiah foretold the establishment of the house of God in the last days. Paul is saying to Timothy that the church is the house of God. So Isaiah chapter 2 is fulfilled. Now, they would completely, totally, 100% ignore the rest of the context of Isaiah chapters 2 through 4. But, hey, they had a great proof text, they thought. Well, the ones that I remember uh, using the Old Testament like that was uh, was in Leroy Brownlow's old book. I'm sure you studied it. Oh, um, yes. Why I'm a member of the Church of Christ. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, why I'm a member of the Church of Christ? Because he got started in Jerusalem, Isaiah chapter 2. Yes. And uh, then you would have the one from Amos, uh, can two walk together except they be agreed. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? And so most of our Old Testament passages were used to uh, differentiate us from the churches around us, you know, come out and be separate, that kind of thing. Absolutely. Well, you're you're exactly right, and it, it is. I mean, a major, major example of, of what can only be called proof texting. Now, what is proof texting, ladies and gentlemen? You know, uh, this is really a critical hermeneutical issue. Hermeneutic is the science, and that's what it is: the science of biblical interpretation. And hermeneutic is saying that when we go to any given text, we have to ask certain questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how? Who wrote it? Who was it written to? Who was it written about? What does it say? Et cetera. Okay. But proof texting goes to a passage. Does it matter if it's an Old Testament pardon me, or a New Testament text? And... You find a passage that sounds convenient uh, that may use some terminology and you don't even look at the full context, but you find a passage that uses some terminology that you're studying and you make an argument from it that is completely divorced from that context. Let me give you a prime illustration of this. I'm currently writing an article uh, for Fulfilled Magazine uh, by Brian Martin uh, out of California. He asked me to address an objection to covenant eschatology. That objection is that in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 35, uh, the Lord said, in due time their foot shall slip and their judgment is at hand. And 
The objection is, well, look, the judgment of Israel was literally hundreds, hundreds of years away. And yet Moses said, the Lord said through Moses in the Song of Moses, see, here is God saying Israel's judgment was at hand. And yet it was hundreds of years off. This proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that God doesn't communicate in time like we do. God doesn't see time like we do. And a similar argument is made on Deuteronomy chapter 4, 24 and 25. Now, my good friend, he's passed away now, but his name was Robert Shank. Are you familiar with with him, Daniel? Uh, the name does sound familiar. Well, Robert Shank was a brilliant scholar. Uh, he was a professor at Western Kentucky Theological Seminary, a Baptist seminary for years. He came to the conclusion that once in grace, always in grace was not valid. It was not true. He came to reject Calvinism, and he became a member of the Churches of Christ. Well, everyone heralded, you know, (laughs) everyone heralded him, oh, what a trophy we have. Here is Robert Shank, this renowned professor in the Baptist theological circles. He's now one of us. Well, little did they know that Robert Shank had not surrendered his dispensationalism. And so Robert Shank, after writing a book, Elect in the Sun, which really is a devastating critique of Calvinism, he wrote another book entitled Until He Comes. And it is dispensational from the table of contents to the very last page. Now, look, Robert was one of the most humble, wonderful men that I've ever known in my life. He was a close personal friend. My mom even supported his ministry financially. He spent time in in my family's home. And so uh, I knew him well enough that I can say all of this stuff. I'm not speaking out of turn in any way whatsoever. But Robert Shank in his book entitled Until He Comes, used Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 25 as a proof text to prove that God's time statements don't mean anything. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 25, the Lord said, you shall soon perish off the land. And so Robert observed, it says soon, not long, and yet we know that the judgment of Israel was literally hundreds of years off. Therefore, time statements don't mean anything. Well, when I when I read that, I, I was I was stunned of how Robert had been so guilty of proof texting. Because in verse 24, the Lord says that when you enter the land and you have dwelt there for many years, many years, and have produced sons and grandchildren and you sin, then, then the Lord will judge you, and your judgment will be at hand. And so here was my good friend, although he was a brilliant scholar, I mean, this is a guy that could read the Greek and the Hebrew, and yet here he was overlooking the context. That, ladies and gentlemen, is proof texting ignoring the actual context. And so when we look at Deuteronomy 4, when we look at Deuteronomy 32, in both passages, we have contextual qualifiers that tell us that the subject and the time frame is Deuteronomy 32, verse 7, after many years to come. It would be in Israel's last days, Deuteronomy 31, verse 29, which is the prelude to the song. I mean, on and on we could go, but this is what you call proof texting, ladies and gentlemen, and that's what happens with a lot of people when they come to to the subject such as the Messianic temple. They do not study the context of John 4 to realize that it is the Old Testament that is the ground, the foundation, and the spring from whence John chapter 4 And Jesus' discussion of Gerizim and Jerusalem and living waters 
actually flows from. And that's not a pun. That's meant to be that way. So go ahead, Daniel, if you want to pick up on that, I've talked a good bit here. Yeah, well, you're, you're exactly right. And uh, John chapter four, at least in my experience, was always uh, turned to for one reason and one reason only. And that was <laughs> to go right to verse 24 <laughs> to quote that passage. Uh, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And I never heard anything personally about the, the Messianic temple or about how this was the fulfillment of all these old covenant promises or anything like that. Um, every now and then someone might go to John four to maybe uh, assist in their uh, retelling of the uh, good Samaritan parable. But, but ultimately that's really all I got out of John four growing up. And so when I started studying covenant eschatology and began you know, I just reread through the entire Bible because I was just so excited. I, so I've, got, I've got to see how this fits in with everything. And I came to John 4. Uh, I was just just blown away. I mean, Jesus's references there to uh, an hour is coming and an hour is coming and now is. And and just all, all that's contained in John 4, as we've already began to, to look at over the past few weeks, really just contextualizes Jesus's entire ministry, you know, uh, in this in this new covenant new temple framework that we never even touched the surface of uh, when when going to John 4, at least at least in my experience. Well, I think you're exactly right. Uh, one of the things that, well, actually, I started to say one of the things, you know, and, and as I sit here and ponder and I think, uh, there's so much about John 4. I, I, I'm exactly like you. And, and I can tell you this. There are a couple of different events in my life that got me to seriously, seriously questioning my upbringing. And this is tragic in one way, and yet on another, uh, it's gratifying to me. My father used to always tell me, and my father wanted me to go to college uh, to the depth of his soul. When I decided to go to preacher school, he was thrilled beyond words. So anyway, uh, He used to tell me, he said, Don, you have to study the Bible for yourself. It doesn't matter what I have taught you. You've got to make up your own mind. You study. You be a good, diligent student of the word. And it doesn't matter if you disagree with me or not. You take your stand on what you believe the Bible actually says. And he said, furthermore, And he told me this before I went to preacher school. It doesn't matter what your instructors say. It doesn't matter how many degrees they've got. And every every, uh, instructor that I had, with one or two exceptions, were fully academically qualified as PhDs. But he told me, he said, it really doesn't matter what they say. If it doesn't agree with what the Bible says, then you reject it. And you take your stand on what the Bible says. Now, if they are able to demonstrate that they're right after all, then be willing to change. So my father's attitude was, here's where I stand until I'm proven wrong. My father was never afraid to be wrong. Now, in the churches of Christ, we're basically taught, I can't be wrong. No, no, no. I I can't be. No, no, no. (laughs) Panic almost sets in to even think about the possibility. And so my father taught me to be that open-minded, to be studious. Now, I said all of that to say this. It is, there are a couple of times in my ministry, especially in my early years, that I have been simply blown away. Actually, there have been a bunch of times when I've been blown away at my ignorance. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Dallas Burdett and I, and I talk about this quite often about how, how appallingly ignorant we have been during the great part of our ministry. <laughs> it's troubling, but it's also exciting. So I'll never forget on one of the very first occasions that this struck me. And I mean, this was early, early, early on in my initial struggles with covenant eschatology. I was reading, you know, that famous story of the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. Here's Philip joins himself to the chariot. And he says, what what, what you reading there? 
And he says, well, it was reading from the prophet, which happened to be Isaiah chapter 53, which the last time I checked was not found in the New Testament. It's from the Tanakh. And Philip began at the same scripture and preached to him Jesus. And Daniel, it hit me one day like that proverbial ton of bricks. Okay, wait a minute. Could I, as a minister, go to the Old Testament and preach the gospel, preach Jesus in such a way that it would cause people to want to obey him? And I have to tell you, at the time that I posed that question to myself, I had to say, I couldn't do that if my life depended on it. Wow. I mean, I mean, obviously, Isaiah 53 has got, got a whole lot to do with it. But I was so entrenched in that view, God did away with the Old Testament at the cross. We don't need the Old Testament because we've got, after all, the Gospels and the Epistles. Who needs the Old Testament? I determined on that day. I was going to try to learn the Old Testament to such an extent that I could preach Jesus from the Old Testament. And a very quick anecdote here. I was in Australia, one of three trips I've been privileged to make over there. And I was up speaking, and I was speaking about the relationship between the Old Testament and the New, there was a woman in the audience that was a practicing Jew. I had been told slash warned that she was there. And you have to understand something. In Australia, if you're up speaking and if you say something someone doesn't agree with, they'll just speak right up and they say, that's not right. (laughs) Uh, so I was sort of kind of prepared but anyway I'm going along there and I said the Jews believe and she just held up her hand and I said yes ma'am and she said not all Jews believe that I forgot now the exact point but it had something to do with the nature of the kingdom and I said ma'am thank you so very much for that correction you are exactly right not all Jews believe that view And so she shook her head, thank you very much, and said, thank you. I proceeded. And I got on Isaiah 53. And I related what I just shared with you. I said, now, ladies and gentlemen, historically, the Jews have struggled to understand Isaiah 53. The question has been, like The Ethiopian eunuch said, of whom speaks the prophet, of himself or of some other man. I said, so you need to understand something. Here is a man, this Ethiopian eunuch, who's been to Jerusalem. He's been listening to the rabbis who, just like him, they don't understand Isaiah 53. They don't understand who it spoke about. And I said, here is Philip inspired by the Holy Spirit, who begins in Isaiah 53 and preaches to the eunuch Jesus as Messiah. And I made a couple of points directly from Isaiah 53, how they related to Jesus. And right there, as I was speaking, this Jewish lady goes, Oh my! Oh my! It absolutely (coughs) blew her away. And I have to share this, and I'm talking a long time here. After the service, now, this woman, by the way, stood six foot two inches. She was a big, I don't mean fat, I mean a big woman. And I didn't know how she was going to react. I knew I knew what how she had re- reacted, but I didn't know how it was going to be like after. 
So she, here she comes, and I'm going, oh, man, I'm going to die. <laughs> and so as she approached me, I held, up her hand, held out my hand to shake my hands with her. She swept my hand aside and embraced me in a bare hug. And I was like, <gasps> I can't breathe. <laughs> I mean, she put me in a bear hug. Did she say sea, water? <laughs> <laughs> no, she did not at that time. But I don't, and I don't know if she ever has because I had to leave shortly after that. But she said, I've got to go back and share this with my brothers and sisters. This wow. is. This is one of the most exciting things I have ever heard in my life. And I said, that's wonderful news. And I said, God bless you as you do that. And like I said, I don't know. I don't know if she ever did. I, I've never heard a word about it. A follow up. But the point being, back to the point that we've, we're looking at here. John chapter 4 and the prophecy or the statements that Jesus is making <clears throat> in John chapter 4 are absolutely full of echoes and allusions to the Old Testament. So as we proceed in our study of this passage, we have to realize that and I've got to make another comment, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Daniel, for you to do some good follow-up here. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been involved in some uh, Facebook and YouTube discussions with individuals. The first one was objecting to my appeal to Jesus in his ministry and to the anticipated consummation, eschatological consummation as the fulfillment of Israel's feast days. And he said, uh, this is one of my main objections to preterism. He said, you're just drawing stuff out of the clear blue sky. He said, I certainly see that Passover through Pentecost was the fulfillment of the feast days. But he said, I've always taken the last three feast days as a reference to our personal individual growth as children of God. And I'm going, where in the world did he get that from? <laughs> you know, that, that was just, that came out of the clear blue. I pointed out, number one, those three last three feast days, in fact, all of Israel's feast days, were always, always, invariably, without exception, viewed as corporate festivals, celebrations. They were never viewed as individual feast days. Did individuals participate in them? Yes. But they were participating as part of the corporate body of Israel. Secondly, I pointed that out, and he actually said, thank you for that. I've never seen that. But secondly, I said, you have to understand, neither Jesus nor the two New Testament writers operated and lived in a theological vacuum. The, the language of the feast days is on the lips of Jesus everywhere we turn. It's on the pen of Paul and the New Testament writers everywhere we read, if we are attuned to it. I said, Jesus and the New Testament writers used the vernacular that was the absolute, inextricably, inseparably bound up with the feast days and used every feast days. And I gave some examples of that. So I said, when I allude to <clears throat> the feast days as the Rosetta Stone of eschatology, and I look at how it is incorporated into the New Testament prophecies of the coming of the judgment, the consummation of the atonement, and the harvest. This is directly from Israel's feast days. Well, it's been a week now, and he completely forsook that discussion. Really nice guy, but the point of fact is, he was trying to look at these biblical texts about judgment, about atonement, and about the harvest in total isolation from Israel's feast days. 
and try to make those illusions, make them into illusions to my personal spiritual walk with the Lord and my spiritual growth. That is not the way those festal illusions were ever, ever used. And with that, Daniel, I'll turn it over to you. I've talked for a good long time here. Sure. And, you know, sometimes we might have a hard time grasping the importance of Israel's festal calendar. But, you know, if we simply just evaluate our own lives and, and how we view holidays, we can see why it was just so important to them. I mean, for crying out loud, Walmart puts up uh, Christmas decorations for sale months and months before. Like in August. <laughs> exactly. And so and so, you know, that um, you know that these these Israelites, these were their holidays. These were their pilgrimage back, pilgrimages back to Jerusalem. The, fe- the festival holidays were always on their mind. And not just the holidays themselves, but the meaning behind them and the uh, the uh, they're they're sort of looking back to the time of the Exodus, but also they're looking forward to the time of the Messiah. And so the fact that a holiday would mean so much to someone shouldn't be that uh, awful su- surprising to us. And <clears throat> when we look at the language of Jesus, as uh, Don, you're mentioning a second ago. This language of the feast days just pops up everywhere. Of course, at the very beginning of the book of John, uh, you know, John the Baptist points out this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so uh, this this really shouldn't be that surprising to us. And I think uh, that the fact that it is just sort of reveals how ignorant we can be um, of the Old Testament and of the biblical background, especially when one looks at the book of John. <laughs> All of Jesus is traveling to and from Jerusalem and the major sermons that he gave were built around the various feast days uh, from Passover to uh, the Feast of Booths to even on occasion uh, those extra feast days that were added on later, you know, the Feast of uh, Dedication for Hanukkah and then Purim for the for Esther and all that. Those are still mentioned in the book of John because those feast days were central to their to their life. And that's when they all got together and celebrated and remembered God and you know the idea that it's that it's connected to eschatology should not be uh, that far fetched to people. Well, you're exactly right, and, and I, I would also point out something I was going to mention a few moments ago, but I had talked too long already. <clears throat> but this is a real classic example uh, when you couple the idea uh, that is found certainly in our fellowships in which we were raised. When you couple that with with what I term an anti-scholarship mentality, then you wind up with this total ignorance of the background for John chapter 4 and the Messianic temple. And here's what I mean. Now, this may seem radical, okay? <clears throat> when I mention the anti-scholarship sentiment, some people may, may recoil at that statement and say, who's against scholarship? Well, I have personally encountered person after person after person who has told who have told me in both written correspondence and they have told me to my face personally when I would quote scholarship on the Greek or the Hebrew or when I would even quote Josephus for that matter. They would tell me I don't care about any of that. All I need is the Bible. I'll never forget on one Facebook discussion, <clears throat> I quoted from some critical uh, commentary, a world-class Greek scholar, and this woman just castigated me, ripped me up one side and down the other. I was just a false teacher and a heretic doomed to eternal hell. And she said, I don't care anything whatsoever about your so-called scholarship. And she cited <laughs> She cited a man that you know his name. I won't call it, but anyway, you know his name. <clears throat> his initials are HD. And she said, he's the greatest scholar that I know. Well, you'll seldom find anybody more abusive of scholarship than this individual. Oh, boy. <laughs> I mean, it's just unbelievable. But here is this woman who is rejecting world-class Greek scholars and who told me, Overtly, I don't care anything about scholarship. All I need is the Bible. Oh, and I need HD here. Uh, I have had other people, when I would quote scholarship, I don't need that. And I mentioned 
this on one particular occasion. I cited a couple of world-renowned scholars, and this one individual says, I don't need any such scholars. All I need is the Bible. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. How did you get the Bible? I said, you do know, don't you, <clears throat> that it was scholars who you're deriding that produced the English translations. And I said, you do know, don't you, that those very scholars have looked into Josephus. They have looked into Tacitus, Suetonius, Dio Cassius. They have looked into all of these really, really, really ancient uh, Greek authorities and historians to find out what these words meant. And I said, so these are scholars who are relying on other scholars who are, in fact, relying on other scholars, and yet you tell me that you don't need scholars. All you need is the Bible, which was produced by men who are scholars, relying on scholars, relying on scholars. Well, he abandoned that discussion as well. So, you know, I, I, I understand what people are trying to say, when they say, all I need is the Bible, well, the Bible is the final authority. There's no question about that. But we cannot be naive enough and we cannot be ignorant enough to say, I don't need scholarship. That's right. You know, um, when I was first really studying covenant eschatology, one of the things that I did was I got... Uh, I got Mounts' uh, uh, Greek courses. I know Dallas, I think he shared those uh, with you, yes. if I'm not mistaken. And yes. uh, he, he suggests in those courses that you get his uh, analytical lexicon of the New Testament. And of course, Mounts, um, you know, someone might ask, why would you want to study those Greek courses or why would you want that lexicon? Don't you just need the Bible? Well, he was on the translational committee for, <laughs> yeah, for some of those, for some of those yeah. translations. For some of the most popular Bibles in use, the English Standard Version and the the new the, the new International Version, at least the newer updates of it, and so when people make that argument that you don't need scholarship, they really don't know, uh, you know, what they're talking about, and and it really says a lot when when you have someone who's especially more of the the King James only kind of camp, um, and they say all I need is my King James Bible, you know, are you are you an Anglican really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, uh, you know just the ignorance is kind of uh, it's kind of frustrating sometimes but but we do need scholarship because we are not first century jews and the bible was a you know is a collection of uh letters especially the new testament written by first century jews to other first century jews and and at least people in gentile congregations who had first century jewish individuals on hand to you know to help explain and help uh help put it into different words, you know, and we don't have the, we don't have that. And so we need our, our libraries and our lexicons and our scholarly historical background sources so that we can try to put the Bible within its proper context. And I think that's probably, uh, that's probably something that a lot of people don't understand. You know, I was always uh, taught to, to look at the context. We have to look at the context, but by that, we only meant really the first two or three verses or maybe a chapter or two around that particular passage that we're studying. Hardly ever did we mean uh, the, the intricacies of the, of the Greek language or the Hebrew language or maybe the, the background or the setting or the geographical location, you know, in which a particular speech or letter was written. You know, um, so much of that is involved in the context. And when we limit it to just reading the few verses before or the few verses after, it's no wonder that we have so much problems, uh, you know, and in, in studying and uh, talking about the Bible uh, to others who, who don't put the time and effort into really trying to grasp that background. Well, that's exactly right. And let, let's apply that right here in John chapter 4. We've already taken slight notice of it. And, you know, here we've talked this morning already or this evening uh, for <clears throat> almost 50 minutes on the background, hermeneutic, context, etc. So let's apply a lot of what we have said, and let's go uh, to John chapter 4. And again, we mentioned this on the, er, on, in the earlier programs, but let's look at John chapter 4, verse 9. A woman of Samaria, in verse 8, uh, 
And that's where Jesus was. He's passing through Samaria. He's going to Jerusalem. And he's sitting there at Jacob's well. And it makes you wonder if he was doing this completely and totally on purpose. If in his foreknowledge of, of this woman who was going to come, the, this woman who, who says, uh, you know, five husbands already. I don't know. We, we are not given insight into that. But nonetheless, he's sitting there at the well, and he says, give me a drink. Now, you mentioned reading things in context and getting the wider context, Daniel. And this whole story is such a prime example of that that helps us appreciate and understand this story. Number one, it was improper In the social world in which Jesus and this woman were living, it was actually somewhat improper. It wasn't unknown, but it was nonetheless somewhat of a social taboo for a man to speak to a woman in public. Now, again, that was not a hard, fast rule. Jesus spoke to women during his ministry, but those were really some exceptional cases. So anyway, this woman is literally shocked. And she says, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask of me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, we can correlate this. We we can understand this to a certain extent with the really sad, horrid racism that has been present in America in our past, in which you had a drinking fountain for African Americans, you had a drinking fountain for whites only. That gets a little bit, that that approaches a little bit, the antipathy that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans at this particular time. And even the violence that manifested itself in America, and unfortunately still would, oh, pardon me, in some, pardon me, in some regions, if allowed, in, in racist areas. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, we, we, get, we get some insight into this, ladies and gentlemen, and this gives us background. This gives us context about the social structure of the day and the animosity that existed between Jews and Samaritans. On one occasion, and we have some some allusion to this in Luke chapter 13, by the way. On one occasion, a group of Samaritans went down to Jerusalem at, during one of the festivals, and they were carrying bags under their cloaks. And in the bags were the bones of dead people. They broke into the temple area, into the priest or into the, uh, uh, the court of Israel. And they started scattering the bones of dead people everywhere. Now, what did that mean? Well, that means that no self-respecting Jew, I mean, those Jews would have scattered like quail when they saw and realized what was going on. Now, when they kind of recovered, they probably would have killed those Samaritans. But what these Samaritans had done, they they had profaned the temple. No Jew could go into that court of Israel until and unless the priest went in there and purified it and sanctified it once again. And so when we read, for instance, over here in in Luke 13, the, the account uh, that Jesus gives, and by the way, boy, I used to proof text this passage like crazy. Uh, <laughs> but anyway... Uh, 
Luke tells us, Luke 13, there were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. How many times did I use that passage in sermons down through the years? Every invitation. Every invitation (laughs) when it had nothing whatsoever to do with what I was saying. Or, verse 4, those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all those other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus was talking about a judgment coming on Israel. He wasn't talking, he wasn't talking about what we have generally made it apply to. A good example of proof texting that I did repeatedly. And by the way, I was at a massive Church of Christ gospel meeting at the Springdale, Arkansas uh, fairgrounds, or rodeo grounds, excuse me. Jimmy Allen, I don't know if you remember that name or not. You may be too young. But Jimmy Allen was a powerful, powerful speaker. And I'm telling you what, he was going after it this night. And there were probably three or 4,000 people present. And boy, he gets up there and he quotes Luke 13, 5. And I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm going, oh, no, Jimmy Allen is mis- or misquoting. That's verse 3. That's not verse 5. Shows you how, I, <laughs> how ignorant I was. So afterwards, I came up to him. And I said, Brother Allen, that was a powerful lesson, but you misquoted. It's verse 3 and not verse 5. He said, well, son, if you read verse 5, you'll find out Jesus repeated himself. And I was like, oh. (laughs) (laughs) But guess what? That was an occasion when I actually got my Bible out and I read the context, not just verse 3, not verse verse 5. I'm going, well, Jimmy Allen and me. We've been misusing that passage. That's not even what we're talking about. Has nothing to do with an invitation. And I was embarrassed beyond words. So here is this context of animosity between the Samaritans, even though the word Samaritans is not used there in Luke 13, that type of animosity is is in the background. So Unless we understand this kind of a context, we may not not even understand or appreciate this woman's statement, how shocked she was when she says, how in the world is it that you, a Jew, ask of me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Shocking beyond measure. And what's also interesting here. I'm sure you've seen this, Daniel, is Jesus doesn't even say explicitly. Now, he's going to get to it, and he'll get to it in a very powerful way. He he doesn't say, well, I want to tell you something, lady. Uh, The time is coming in which these ethnic barriers that have separated us for centuries, they're going to be torn down. Now, again, he does. He doesn't say it in those terms, but he does say that we'll have to get to next week. The time is coming, the hour is coming, at which neither on this mountain, which is Mount Gerizim, nor in Jerusalem will men worship God. So when he says that, he is actually addressing the ethnic, the social, and even the racial barriers that are going to come crashing down. And what an amazing statement it was. And folks, it's all about the Messianic temple. Those ethnic, social, racial barriers would be torn down when Jesus, the foundation stone, the cornerstone of the Messianic temple would be fully established. Daniel, why don't you uh, give us your brief summary because we are out of time and then we'll close yeah. it, close it out. <clears throat> That's right. And, uh, and as uh, Don mentioned a moment ago, um, 
this passage is similar to Luke 13, 3, because when he says that neither in this mountain or in Jerusalem, he meant it would be quite impossible <laughs> to go to either because that, that whole uh, region would be leveled by the Roman Empire in, uh, in just a few short years after Jesus' ascension. Well, uh, that's that's the hour, folks. And so uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening on uh, Two Guys in the Bible. And we look forward to uh, being with you back next week, Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central, uh, to talk more about John 4 and the Messianic Temple. Thank you so much for being with us.